about Macutubule, but for this first uh, Macutubule session. Uh, and so it's going to be in uh, plants. So maybe first, okay, oops. So first I need to say something about plants. So plants are uh, pressurized objects. So, and this is something you can uh, easily see. I'd like to thank. Hello, baby. Okay, this uh, <laughs> excuse <wrong>. me, please <laughs> play mute yourself. Okay. Sorry, okay. Just, uh, yeah, so I was just saying, so the, the plants are pressurized and they are pressurized by uh, water. And so this is something you can uh, easily uh, see. You just have to stop watering your plants and they're going to deflate. So it means that usually they're inflated and they have uh, trigger pressure. Okay, uh, oops. So the, the physical model, let's say, for a plant actually is a very simple one. It's uh, that of a balloon, basically. So what we, uh, there is evidence, and actually this is from the 19th century, so this is really um, old news, that the epidermis is under tension and the inner tissues are under compression. And so this uh, balloon analogy actually is uh, it's very convenient because, of course, the, the mechanics of balloon is, is quite simple. So we can uh, derive a number of rules from, um, from this uh, analogy. Um, okay, so and so when we think about this, so of course, if you have a pressure inside uh, the plant, and actually all living organisms have to deal with the mechanical stress, and uh, so for for this, we usually uh, draw this type of loop, and so this is true in plants, but as I said, it's true for any uh, living organism. It's true for bacteria, for fungi, for animals, uh, anything. So basically, you have uh, shape and growth can be multicellular, can be cellular. This uh, can prescribe uh, stress, a stress pattern. And so this stress can be perceived by the cell. The cell is responding to stress. And so in plants, uh, the cell, what the cell is doing usually is that it's reinforcing its cell wall to resist to stress. And so this loop is, and, and in turn, this is going to affect the shape and growth. And so this is really a universal loop, I would say, in the, if you take really a step back, because all cells have to resist stress. A cell that does not resist mechanical stress is dying. So if it's alive, it means that it's constantly resisting uh, stress. All right, and so for the mechanisms through which uh, plant cells are perceiving uh, stress, there is a number of uh, candidates, uh, candidate mechanosensors. And so there's a number of uh, proteins that are at, at the plasma membrane. So a little bit like uh, integrins in uh, animals, but of course there's no integrin homologue in plants. So we think it's um, some of these other proteins that are likely involved. So you have a number of uh, proteins here, but we are, I'm not going to go through the entire list. Uh, we focused actually on one of them uh, only. And so we, we used the very young plants. So this is like a seven day old uh, Arabidopsis plant. So just a germination basically. And so you see here the stem and here the two uh, cotyledons, which are the embryonic leaves. And so that way you can have a lot of material in uh, not too much time. And you can see the cells within their tissue and even within the, the wool uh, plant. And so what we see when we look at the epidermis of these uh, young leaves or these uh, cotyledons, so here you see, uh, so Col zero, that's the wild type. You see uh, all these uh, cells that are puzzle shaped. So this is actually an interesting feature of uh, epidermal cell in, uh, in plants. And you see also uh, some of the stomata. So this is four days after germination. So you see the cells are like this. And 12 days after germination, you see the cells are much bigger. So there's been some growth. And uh, the interesting thing is that when you look at this mutant, Feronia, so this is a mutant in one of the receptor like kinase I mentioned uh, earlier. You see this uh, white stuff here. So this is uh, propidum iodide uh, staining showing a dead cell. And if you look 12 days later, there's a lot of uh, death. So a lot of, de of cells have died. And when we look at the kinetics, actually these are cells that have uh, swollen and then burst. So these are burst cells. So these are, these are cells that are unable to manage the stress level. So stress is increasing, there is tension in the cell wall because of trigger pressure, and, the, and basically the, the cell wall breaks uh, in, this, uh, in this mutant. So you see here that I put 0.7% uh, agar, so this is the growth medium in which we grow the plant, so this is all uh, in vitro. And so we tried something, a very simple experiment, which is to uh, increase the agar concentration. So this time we grow the same plants, but on 2.5% agar. And so when we do this, uh, so of course you have a medium that is a bit uh, stiffer, but uh, mainly what you affect is the matrix potential. So that means that the water is staying with the agar and is uh, less available to the plant. So it's almost like mimicking uh, drought conditions. 
And so what you see in the wild type is that, so to start with, the cells are not that different from the 0.7% agar, but you see that 12 days after germination, the cells are a bit smaller compared, or actually largely smaller than uh, the, at 0.7% uh, agar. And so this makes sense, right? There is less water, so there is less growth. So you have less tension in the cell wall, so you have less growth. But what's really striking is that in the mutant, you see the mutant, so there is maybe like one dead cell here, and you see that 12 days after germination, we've uh, restored a lot of the cell. Uh, I mean, the, most of the cells are alive, actually. There's much less uh, cell death. So, of course, we've quantified, obviously, but I, I don't uh, show it here. But it's really a, a significant effect. And so this is really a nice way to um, to affect tension and to see that in the mutant, actually, you are, uh, because you reduce tension, actually, you, you, uh, you rescue uh, the phenotype just because you reduce the level of, uh, of tension. So this is at the cell level, but of course we looked at the uh, wool organ level and uh, you see the same type of uh, thing. So uh, this is the wool cotyledon uh, in the wild type, four day, eight day, 12 days after germination. You see the cotyledon is growing. You see feronia, so it's dying. Huh? It's uh, turning yellow because all the cells are exploding, like uh, <laughs> they're bursting. And you see the same uh, comparison, but this time on 2.5% agar. And you see that uh, here the, the cotyledon is green. So the cells are still alive, and actually you can really rescue a lot of the of the phenotype. But you see, still see that the the cotyledon is a bit smaller, so it's it's not like a full rescue, but it's a large rescue. Let's say. And so there is the quantification uh, here. All right. So we have now. Uh, we think, and I, of course, I don't go into the details, but uh, we we know we think we have uh, a good uh, a good sensor. Let's say feronia that is necessary for the cell to perceive mechanical stress and to start this loop in a way, right? So to perceive the stress and to reinforce uh, its uh, cell wall. So of course, the next question is what is downstream of uh, feronia? So it's perceiving stress, but how does the cell uh, reinforce its cell wall uh, downstream of uh, feronia? And so here I need to say something about the plant cells that is a bit uh, unique to plant cells. So this is a, a rough comparison between uh, an, an animal cell and a plant cell. And here what I'm interested in is the cortical cytoskeleton. So in animal cells, usually you have um, a, a, a tough uh, cortex of uh, actomyosin. So this is the red lines here. Uh, whereas in plants, uh, the cortex is populated by microtubules, cortical microtubules. So the right below the plasma membrane, there's a lot of microtubules. And actually, when you compare plants and animals, the two, cyto the two main cytoskeleton, let's say actin and microtubules, uh, they have been uh, swapped in a way. So the, in animals, the actin is at the cortex and it's controlling cell shape, and microtubules are doing most of the vesicle trafficking. Whereas in plants, the cortical microtubules are controlling cell shape and the actin is doing most of the trafficking. But here, of course, I'm interested mostly in the microtubules. And so uh, for years, actually, of studies have shown this, right? So if you look here in the, so this is an ob oblique section in a plant cell. So you see here, this is the cell wall, the gray stuff. Uh, the plasma membrane is uh, the black line here, so, sort of. And you see right below the plasma membrane, you see these lines here. So these lines actually are tubes and these are microtubules. And actually, this is the very first image of microtubules. And the very first image of macrotubule was actually in plant cells, just because um, those cells are full of macrotubule right below the plasma membrane, so it's very easy uh, to see them. And so what do they do, actually? So these macrotubules, they do a number of things, but one of the main functions they have is cortical macrotubule. So they are right below the plasma membranes. It's to guide a complex, which is called the cellulose synthase complex, which is synthesizing cellulose in the cell wall. And so what you see here is that the macrotubules are, are thought to act like uh, rail tracks, for the complex here. And so when uh, the macrotubules are oriented like this, the cellulose synthase is synthesizing uh, cellulose and the, dep the uh, deposition of cellulose is actually aligned with the macrotubule. So the cellulose uh, polymerization is, is in a way the motor for the movement of the cellulose synthase. I mean, there are probably other factors, but <laughs> that's one of the motors, let's say. And so here you have a good collinearity between uh, macrotubule and cellulose. And of course, this uh, cellulose alignment uh, allows the cell wall to resist to stress. Huh? Cellulose is as stiff as steel, so it's really uh, resisting to uh, turgor pressure. Turgor pressure is in the megapascal range, huh? so it's really strong pressure. So you need something very stiff to resist to it. And so uh, we and others, we showed that actually all this is aligned with maximal tension. So this is a very neat system in which a macrotubule align with maximal tension, and by doing this, they align cellulose in the direction of maximal tension, so that way you resist uh, maximal tension through cellulose alignment. 
So I can show you this on the, on this uh, image. So this is again the, the surface and epidermis in the cotyledon. And you see here, this is the stomata. So these are the pores that are allowing the gas exchange with the, the rest of the leaf. And these are the, the, the pavement cells around uh, the stomata. And so what I'm going to show you is, and so in green, of course, it's the max tubules. So what I'm going to show you, so here the stomata is uh, open. And uh, now I'm going to show it like a few hours later when it's closed. And so when it's closed, it looks like this. And you see that, uh, so, uh, so it has closed, but mainly what you see is that the MAC tubules have changed their orientation. And so now if we calculate a stress pattern for this uh, deformation, and so here you have to keep in mind this, that this is a 3D uh, deformation as well. So actually the stomata is moving up as it's uh, closing. Actually the stress pattern, the tensile stress pattern becomes circumferential as the stomata is closing. And you see that the MAC tubules are following this new uh, stress pattern. So maybe I can show uh, back and forth. So this is uh, before and after, and you see that the MAC tubules are, have realigned with the, the putative, the predicted uh, stress pattern. Okay. so. Mechanistically, there is this um, model, let's say, that says that feronia, which is at the plasma membrane, would bind uh, something in the cell wall, so pectin in this case. And downstream of feronia, there's all these uh, raw GTPAs and effectors that are, affect uh, catenin activity. And catenin is a MAC tubule severing protein that uh, severs MAC tubule. <laughs> so you would have a link between uh, the cell wall and po possibly the cell wall stress through feronia all the way to the MAC tubule. So this was published in the bioarchive and it's coming out. Uh, soon in, uh, in current biology now. And so the idea would be that, well, that, that's it, right? We, we have our pathway and MAC tubules are downstream of Feronia. So we wanted to test this. And so for this, we, we used a very simple um, uh, test, which is uh, this one. So this is a uh, virtual cell. So this is the, the pattern of tension in an epidermis that is under tension. And so what, so what we do is that we just do an ablation. So we kill one cell. And so this is sufficient to generate a circumferential stress pattern around the cell. So this is a very, very simple test to locally change the mechanical stress pattern. And so when we do this in, a, in the plant tissue, so here, here we, it's before the ablation. So we kill one cell and you see that the MAC tubules are reorienting around the ablation. So matching the maximal uh, tensile stress uh, direction. So we do this in our uh, system. And so here, so maybe you don't see very well. So the red lines are the local alignment of MAC tubules, but maybe the quantific quantification actually is uh, probably simpler to see. So what we see in the wild type, so between T0 and T7 hours, and it takes a long time for the wool alignment to, uh, to appear. You see that uh, most cells have circumferential MAC tubules uh, at the end. So the MAC tubules are aligned around the, the ablation. But the surprise was that when we do the same in uh, Feronia, and I can, you can see it on this image, the MAC tubules are very well aligned around the ablation. And actually, so when we do the quantification, there is no significant difference between the wild type and the mutant. So this means that the MAC tubules can reorient uh, along maximal tensile stress direction without feronia. So feronia is uh, upstream of something else, but not of uh, MAC tubules. <laughs> So this led us to think that maybe there is um, there's two independent pathways. So there's one feronia pathway and there's one macrotubule cellulose pathway and both contribute to the mechanical integrity of uh, plant cells. And so to test this, uh, what we did was to um, so to look at feronia again, so uh, this is uh, just uh, uh, feronia on 0.7% agar. You see the, the ablation, uh, sorry, so the, this is feronia and sorry, yeah, <laughs> this is feronia here. This is the wild type here and feronia here. So you see the ablation uh, here again, uh, the cells are bursting, but when you add orizaline, so here you depolymerize the MAC tubule, you see many more uh, dead cells. And actually here, when you quantify, you see the number of dead cells uh, in feronia without uh, MAC tubule depolymerization. But if you do, if you add feronia and MAC tubule depolymerization, you have more burst cells. So this shows that this is an additive phenotype. And so this, is, this goes in the line that uh, both pathways uh, can be independent and uh, additive. So what we think uh, is happening is that actually there is probably these two pathways uh, feronia and uh, cellulose synthesis or MAC tubule dependent cellulose synthesis that are reinforcing the cell wall independently. And so these two pathways are uh, likely necessary for plant cells to switch from passive material to active material. So a passive material is just you, you 
take a piece of rubber, you pull on it and it breaks. There is no resistance uh, whatsoever. And so this is really what we see in plants. We really mimic this type of behavior. The cells are swelling and they burst. Whereas if you have feronia and uh, macrotubules and cellulosynthesis, then the cell is resisting, reinforcing its cell wall and then uh, resist uh, tugger pressure. All right, so uh, here we have uh, our pathway feronia, we have the macrotubules, but of course, uh, so we are still uh, looking at what is uh, downstream of feronia. So this is uh, another part. But of course, the other question would be, what is upstream of macrotubule? What, how does the macrotubule know how to resist uh, to tensile stress and in which uh, direction? So here, I must say that we've tried uh, many, many candidates, uh, many uh, mutants in receptor like kinase, in uh, mechanosensitive uh, channels. We tried uh, mutants with hormones. And actually, we always see a macrotubule response to stress. So the macrotubule response to stress can be a bit slower, a bit faster, but there's always a response. So now we have this idea that maybe actually there's nothing upstream of macrotubules and that macrotubules themselves act as mechanosensors. So they are able, they would be able to sense uh, tension in the cell wall indirectly, of course, but they would act to, uh, they would respond to, to stress um, without the need for a, a biochemical cascade uh, upstream of macrotubules. So to test this, we can just look at the literature to start with. So this is uh, data in vitro. So these are single macrotubule in vitro uh, with um, an optical uh, tweezer. So you basically you trap a macrotubule and you pull on it. And then you measure the polymerization rate of this macrotubule. And what uh, so this study and others have shown is that when you put a macrotubule under tension, you promote uh, polymerization. So this again, actually, this alone actually is sufficient to say that uh, macrotubules can be considered as mechanosensors because their behavior depends on their uh, mechanical status in a way. So when you put them under tension, they polymerize uh, faster. So that's in vitro, though. So of course, it's not completely uh, satisfying. So uh, we we can uh, explore a little bit the the mechanism where this could happen. And so uh, a few years ago, actually, that was in 2019, uh, we we showed that. Um, uh, so, I mean, we, we know actually that uh, for polymerization to, to occur, for a macrotubule to polymerize, uh, you need to hydrolyze uh, GTP into GDP. And so what this does is, is make, it's making the protofilament uh, closer to one another. So it's making the ends of the macrotubule more uh, compact. And this is what is promoting uh, polymerization. But you see that this type of deformation, you can also do it through a force, right? So if you pull on the macrotubule through buckling, you're going to uh, put the protofilament back uh, together. And so this would also promote uh, polymerization. So this is just one hypothesis where we could uh, think that the, actually the shape uh, of the end of the macrotubule could be uh, sens sensitive to uh, tension levels and could promote uh, polymerization. So of course, this, this is completely speculative. Huh? This is only a, a model, uh, but something to, uh, to dig into. And we could think of other uh, possible models, of course. So to go a little bit more into uh, this type of hypothesis, we uh, designed uh, like more cellular based or cell based uh, models in which we grow macrotubule in a confined space. And so in this case, you see uh, here like virtual macrotubules growing in an uh, ellipsoid uh, shaped uh, cell or like a space, let's say. So the macrotubules are growing in all directions. And so uh, there is a number of interesting features in this model. So here we only have uh, macrotubules that are polymerizing, depolymerizing, and uh, bundling. So when they're next to each other, they bundle. And so with only these three rules, uh, what we see is that uh, the first thing is that uh, we see that macrotubules tend to become cortical. So we let the macrotubule grow in all directions, but at the end, most of the macrotubules are cortical. And so this is actually an emerging property of their stiffness. So because they have a high persistent length, uh, macrotubules tend to, uh, so to collide. So they, they will collide with the edge of the cell. And now they are going to, uh, as they are at the surface, they are going to interact with each other in a 2D space. And this alone is uh, promoting their interaction with one another. And this is going to populate the, the cortex with uh, macrotubule. So the cortical position of macrotubule is actually an emerging property of their stiffness. And the other feature that we found in, uh, in this model is, uh, is actually on the left side, is that if you don't add anything else, uh, usually the macrotubule tend to be longitudinal. So if you have this ellipsoid, the overall bias is towards longitudinal macrotubule. And this again can be related to the, to the persistent length of macrotubule because this axis 
is the flattest part of the ellipsoid. And so the macubule, if they are really stiff, they, they would prefer to align with the flattest part of the, of the cell or of the ellipsoid. They would avoid the most curvy part of the cell. So we think that based on the model, that macutubules are by default longitudinal in an ellipsoid cell or in an elongated cell. The interesting thing is that when you uh, look at this type of ellipsoid, and if it is pressurized, the, the, the tension at the surface should be transverse. And this is well, uh, this is well demonstrated in uh, engineering. You can also think of um, a sausage on the barbecue. Uh, that's always the example I take. So if you put a sausage on the barbecue, it opens lengthwise. So that means that tension is stronger along the maximal curvature, so along this, uh, this axis. So you see that this is the by default MacTubule orientation, longitudinal, and uh, here you see that if we put MacTubule lining with tension, they should be transverse. So there is a contradiction. We say that MacTubules are by default longitudinal, but we also have evidence that MacTubules are aligning with tension, so they should be transverse. So the interesting thing in this model is that uh, here, so in, in this model, actually, we haven't put 100% of the MacTubule to follow uh, tension. We here we we did uh, we we well we input in the model that only one percent of the MacTubule see the tension and align with tension, and you see that the entire network is switching to a transverse orientation. So that means that the longitudinal bias of the MacTubule is a weak bias. Any over Q, like even a very weak Q, a one percent Q in in an over direction, is sufficient to change the entire network. And so this actually sort of makes sense to me. Uh, it's probably like during evolution, uh, MacTubules might have been selected to be sensitive to external cues, right, and not to be locked into this uh, longitudinal uh, orientation. So this is the prediction from the model. So of course now we need to test it uh, in cellulo. And so this is something uh, I started to do with uh, in a sabbatical in Singapore in, uh, in 2019. So before the COVID and the <laughs> travel ban, let's say. So what we did here, so this was with uh, Virgil Viasnov and uh, Tim Sanders, with uh, Antoine Chevalier, uh, student there, and uh, later on with uh, Leia Collin. Uh, so what we did basically here is to use plant cells we digested uh, the cell wall, so now we have protoplast. So we have, have almost something that looks like uh, an animal cell. It's like a, a sphere without a cell wall. And we centrifuge this protoplast in these uh, micro wells where there is some uh, square-shaped uh, wells, let's say, in plastic. Right? It's uh, no way 73 uh, polymer, so it's a stiff uh, plastic. And so now we can confine this protoplast and we can change the shape of the protoplast. And so with this, uh, because they are pressurized, we can also change the, the stress pattern and see what is the orientation of the, of the MacTubule. So this is what we, de what we do with uh, rectangular micro well, which is of course much more interesting because now we start to have this uh, ellipsoid shape. So here you see the membrane signal. So we have uh, squeezed uh, protoplast. So it's not a sphere anymore. It's, it has uh, curvature anisotropy. So the maximal curvature is, is transverse, and this is the predicted uh, tension pattern in this uh, squeezed uh, protoplast. And because they are pressurized, you have this tension in this direction. Eh? Again, it's the sausage on the barbecue. Eh? It's the same, uh, same idea. So this is the prediction. And so when we look at uh, back tubules, uh, we see that actually on these examples, and of course, it's very noisy, but we see that uh, the number of protoplasts have MacTubules that tend to be rather transverse, so matching uh, the predicted tension in this, uh, at the membrane in this uh, protoplast. So, of course, we need to quantify this, so we use the uh, local alignment uh, protocol from uh, Satoru Tsugawa, so it, basically you uh, skeletonize uh, locally the MacTubules and you get these uh, maps of uh, orientation for each uh, protoplast, so and when you do this for like some, some, something like uh, 200 protoplasts, you see that there is um, a bias in the transverse orientation. So it's not such a strong bias, but there is a bias in the transverse orientation for uh, this protoplast. So the maxtubule tend to align with maximal tension in this protoplast. And so this is nice for us because here we remove the cell wall, we remove the neighboring cells. It's only a very, very simple system, and we still have the bias towards uh, MacTubule aligning with tension. So this goes with the idea that you don't need too much upstream of um, MacTubule, that MacTubule can do the business uh, on their own. 
So of course, we did a number of uh, uh, controls. So first, we wanted to make sure that it's not due to the adhesion of the protoplast to the sides of the well. So we can use uh, pyronic acid to do a passivation of the of the well. So we remove uh, electro electrostatic uh, interactions. And so here you see that you have the same type of bias. So it's, the tubules are still uh, transverse. We can also uh, use narrower wells. So this uh, on the right, the wells are 15 micrometer in um, in width, and this one is 12 micrometer in width. So it's uh, it's a bit smaller and you see that uh, so in this case we would predict uh, higher tension and we see that the bias is stronger as well so the mac tubules are transverse but there are more <laughs> mac tubules that are transverse or more protoplasts with transverse mac tubules so the this matches with the, the prediction and so uh, of course we did the reverse uh, experiment so in this case we used the uh, hyper osmotic uh, condition so in this case we deflate the protoplast so the protoplast is not pressurized uh, anymore and so they're not always as long as this huh? we also have the let's say normal protoplast and so what we see is that when we deflate the protoplast then we switch back the mac tubule to the longitudinal orientation which we think is the by default orientation so the mac tubules go back to their <laughs> longitudinal orientation when we deflate uh, the protoplast. So they, they, are only, they, they would be only uh, governed by the geometry of the cell, but not by the tension at the surface. And so the last, we can also do, of course, the, the dynamics or analyze the dynamics of this system. So we start here with uh, MacTubule, with um, protoplast in a hyper osmotic uh, or hypertonic conditions. So like deflated uh, protoplast, the MacTubules are roughly uh, longitudinal. And then we switch to uh, 280 millismol per liter. So now we pressurize the protoplast. So we increase tension in the membrane. And you see that the new microtubules that are appearing are in the transverse orientation. So we start to see the bias uh, uh, appearing in this, uh, in this system. So we think that indeed... So, so, so we think that indeed the mac tubules. I mean, I, I, we still need to explore. Huh? That's why I, I keep the question mark here. But we think that the mac tubules have the ability to uh, to perceive tension uh, somewhat on their own. Of course, they need to be anchored anchored with one another with the membrane, so it's not completely on their own. But they can be uh, mechanosensitive and align with uh, tension in uh, in plant cells. So I think I have almost finished. So I just want to uh, do a, put a little ad for a, a new journal, which is called Quantitative Plant Biology. So this is a journal that is um, uh, open to anyone uh, working on plants, but uh, or actually if you're not working on plants, but you have some kind of connection with plants, you're of, of course uh, very welcome. Uh, so in this journal, we are trying to be ethically uh, very strong with an open access community-based uh, editors, um, not-for-profit uh, institutions, and we are interested in uh, systems biology or anything that is uh, where the focus is on the questions using uh, quantitative uh, approaches. So don't hesitate to submit your paper. All right, so this is the team, and uh, I need to thank uh, mainly uh, Leia and Antoine for the, the protoplast uh, story, and uh, Alice Maliver for the, the Feronia project, and of course, all my collaborators. So thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Olivia. Very interesting talk. So that's why I didn't stop you. <laughs> so now, Joe, um, can you just uh, ask your question? You had, that was a very fascinating uh, talk. Thank you for that. Um, you. I was just wondering what was happening in the, um, you know, in plant, you know, the hopococcal cells, or I forget what exactly what they're called, but you know, where there's the, you know, they have the the response to blue light in which the microtubules reorient, and they go from a radial array the sausage array yeah to a you know to a longer you know to an axial uh, array and i just wonder i mean that would be like um that would be like the um the blue light response is somehow causing the microtubules to lose their meccano uh, or their tension sensing how do you is that is that something that you're thinking about that yep, seems yep, like yep. that's right Absolutely. So I have an hypothesis for this because this is a very, very uh, fast response. And mm -hmm. for me, what happens with blue light is that it's probably blue light is probably affecting tugger pressure. So what when you shine blue light, a growth stops almost immediately. So the for me, the simplest way to stop growth so quickly is to drop tugger pressure very quickly. If you drop tugger pressure, then you don't have tension in the in the membrane, and then the macrobule will switch to longitudinal. So, that, but for me, that would be the most parsimonious uh, hypothesis. But I, I, we haven't done any measurement of tugger pressure in this system. <laughs> yeah, because I, I see. Because I thought, I mean, because that's you know that's a sort of a chicken and egg problem. Because I would have, you know, because I would have thought that it was the microtubule reorientation that was 
changing, you know, allowing the the you know the the cell to bend or the, st the stem to bend, whereas lowering the turga pressure might actually do that alone. So the microtubules may just be following rather than than causing the the movement. Is that is that what you're thinking? So I I, th I think there's a, a bit of both. <laughs> of course, it's a loop. but but I would say the the first trigger I would I would buy that the first trigger is a drop in turga pressure just because the mm. the growth arrest is very yeah. very fast and uh, the microtubule reorientation would take some time before you yeah. stop growth right oh. because you would have to uh, translate into yeah. cellulose. Fabulous. You could measure that. Yeah. Great. Okay. okay. That's good, Joe. Thank, Thank you. you for the question. Um, since we. Uh, Probably we have to move on. You see there, uh, 